Sepsis uh, is recently defined a couple of years back as uh, an organ dysfunction, you know, suspected or proven infection with organ dysfunction. An organ dysfunction is quantified by doing a sequential organ failure assessment or a SOFA score. And if the delta SOFA is more than equal to 2, then we consider it as sepsis. Compared to earlier definitions where, you know, wherever we had the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and there was a, a suspected or proven infection, we used to call it sepsis. Now we are trying to highlight the most sick patients and labeling them as sepsis. So that is the change and septic shock uh, is a subset of these patients where uh, you know after adequate fluid resuscitation uh, the patient still remains hypotensive and the systolic pressure is uh, low as well as the lexerum lactate levels continue to be more than equal to 2 millimoles per liter and we have uh, to start vasopressor therapy. So that subgroup is called septic shock and we know that mortality with septic shock is quite high. So we have abandoned the previous terms of uh, sepsis, severe sepsis. The old severe sepsis is now called sepsis. So we are using only two terminology that is sepsis and septic shock. It is uh, you know also very important that people, uh, physicians working in emergency and uh, wards are also sensitized to the uh, you know their patients developing uh, sepsis or septic shock so in the past they were advised to follow the quick sofa which had three components uh, tachypnea altered sensorium and hypotension but now we have realized that that becomes sort of non-specific so we are uh, asking them to look at SIRS, MUSE or NEWS those uh, newer uh, uh, you know scoring criteria and if they feel that patient uh, has a suspicion of uh, sepsis based on these criteria, they can investigate and go for a full SOFA. Because early identification is very, very important. If you delay the identification, you delay the antimicrobial therapy, then the mortality is going to be very high. As you know, antimicrobial resistance is a huge big challenge in India and this was highlighted way back, I think almost a decade back uh, uh, by the um, NDM1 story that was published by David Livermore and his group. So he identified a lot of you know, plasmid mediated NDM1 uh, in India and then there was a lot of hallagulla and finally they demonstrated that there is the, the, the you know lot of NDM1 plasmid mediated were isolated from the water in, in uh, from around Delhi. So there is a problem and this NDM1 was resistant to most of the drugs except cholestin and polymyxin B. That was the challenge. Of late we have seen that uh, we are facing the challenge with enterobacteriaceae, Klebsiella pneumoniae. E. coli is also behaving the Klebsiella way. Now these are carbapenem resistant bugs. So the entire Enterobacterials are behaving as carbapenem resistant. Uh, we have pseudomonas which is again showing carbapenem resistance so that continues to be a problem. Then we have carbapenem resistant crab Acinetobacter baumanniae so that is another challenge. So and these challenges are many fold in India because uh, uh, of the way we are using uh, antibiotics we uh, are you know sort of using inappropriate uh, antibiotics we are not using the right dosing or for the right indication plus the soft regulations that are there in India you know one of the scathing reports that ap appeared in Lancet uh, which published almost last month clearly said that uh, uh, CDSCO which is the regulatory body only 30 percent of the uh, antibiotics are approved by them rest because of the loose regulations the state authorities are allowing whereas they have no mechanism to uh, sort of uh, you know identify whether the particular combination is good or bad. So the plethora of fixed dose combinations that are available FDCs circulating in Indian market is highest in the world. So I think uh, DCGI, CDSCO and the state regulatory has to work in sync uh, to control this and scientific rational has to be proven before any you know uh, such thing is uh, allowed. Another report that came up recently was by Kamini Walia from ICMR AMR group. Now that is also a very serious report because what it is saying is entire enterobacteriaceae is showing resistance. E. coli is also showing resistance the Klebsiella way. So the resistance 
uh, uh, has increased for Pseudomonas it has increased for Acinetobacter baumannii it has increased. So what they showed was possibly cholestin uh, and polymyxin B and in 50 percent cases minocycline was uh, showing sensitivity otherwise all antibiotics were resistant. And it also highlighted the only you know good point was that for typhoid fever uh, at least the sensitivities have not gone up. So this was another I think wake up call to us. Uh, you know what needs to be done at the national level is we need to create an antimicrobial resistant national database. So it should be made mandatory for industry for healthcare industry to uh, submit their microbiological data so that they can have region wise, state wise, city wise uh, data of resistant patterns and the sensitivity uh, data. And then we also need like I said these regulatory bodies which sanction the approval give the approval for the drug. Uh, they need to work in tandem and of course the regulations are there but OTC sale of antibiotics has to be strictly curtailed. Hospitals have to start antimicrobial stewardship program where they need to monitor the uh, you know some of the uh, drugs their usage whether it is being justified or it is uh, uh, you know people are using inappropriately. They have to look at the defined daily dosing whether they it's it's far in excess of what the WHO data says or what developed countries are uh, their data is showing. So I think lot of activities are required to uh, to understand and to act on this antimicrobial resistance. Otherwise uh, you know sooner or later we'll land up in a situation where a patient is uh, pan resistant and no antibiotics uh, is going to help and that patient is going to die. So it's a wake up call big wake up call.